I'm a little bit ashamed to admit it, but I spend about an hour every day scrolling through those gorgeous squares on Instagram. These days, there really is a filter for everything. You got your filters for food, for fashion, or even specifically in this case, New York City coffee shops. I could go on about this, but unfortunately, I'm not here to teach you how to edit your Instagram photos. For hundreds of years, the primary consumers of images and photographs have been us, humans. As a result, photography has evolved with our own tastes in mind. We care about things like how much the subject of the photo pops, how the photographer has captured beauty in everyday moments, and whether the photo evokes some sort of emotion in us, kind of like this piece of avocado toast. Today, however, the algorithms that are powering artificial intelligence are as hungry for images, if not more, than we are. Think about the cell phone in your hand performing facial recognition, the augmented reality apps for virtual clothing try-ons, or the self-driving cars on the street. Cameras are everywhere, constantly capturing information for algorithms to digest. The qualities that we care about in our photos might not matter at all to these computer programs. After all, for that same image, this is what the computer would see. Maybe you've heard about computer vision, machine learning, or these things called neural networks. Researchers in these fields have built computer programs that can learn to perform visual tasks like facial recognition or object detection after training with millions of images. Neural networks are at the core of many of these algorithms and are poised to become a regular part of our daily lives. We can think of a neural network as a brain made of layers of mathematical neurons that you can teach to perform a certain function. Each of these layers is essentially just a set of filters, in a way like the filters we apply in photo editing apps. Information travels through these connected layers, and filters are applied on top of each other until finally the network reaches a decision. At a high level, the way these networks learn is comparable to how humans learn. As an infant sees its mother in a variety of different circumstances, from all different angles and in all different outfits, it gradually learns to associate this person with the word mom, or some variant of that. Similarly, after we show a fresh neural network thousands of images of, for example, cats, it can learn to recognize new images of cats as well. As this learning process is occurring, the network is figuring out how to choose the best filters to produce the correct answer. Larger and more complicated versions of this network have been used to understand images in even more detail. For example, segmenting an image into parts per pixel, or even automatically generating natural language captions. However, as these networks become more and more complex, they also require more time, energy, and memory to use. It's amazing that we can do some of these things at all, but often they can only occur at research institutions with huge amounts of computational resources in contrived experiment settings. It would be great if we could do these same things on our cell phones, processing images as we walked around in our daily lives, but as it is, the networks might need to be compressed to fit and then lose accuracy as a result. Even then, we might find our phone battery draining in less than an hour. Alternatively, we could try to send everything to the cloud for computing, but it also takes time to transmit that information as well. And then what happens when your self-driving car loses signal on a road trip? For a lot of these applications, every millisecond counts. Therefore, research is ongoing into making hardware and software more efficient for neural networks. There may be another option, though, something that hasn't been as heavily explored. While these neural networks were being developed in computer science departments, I was more fascinated by something else. Optics, or the study of light and how it interacts with the physical matter of our universe. My childhood bedtime stories consisted of my dad explaining to me why the sky looks blue, how rainbows appear, or why we sometimes see mirages shimmering on the road on hot summer days. In high school and then in college, I learned to deconstruct these natural phenomena with math and physics, and even had the chance to try out some of the classical optical experiments hands-on. But, and any engineer may relate to this, it wasn't quite enough to take things apart. I felt like I needed to put it back together again and to make something new. Now, during my PhD, I'm still thinking about these same concepts every day, but I'm trying to explore ways to use them to our advantage. 
as I heard more about machine learning and neural networks and how applicable they are to everyday life, I started wondering if the natural interactions that occur with light could be harnessed to perform the computations of a neural network, especially since the information stored in those images being fed into those neural networks was originally captured in the form of light hitting a camera sensor. So let's take it back to those Instagram or Snapchat filters that we use to shape how our social network sees our lives. We also have the capability to design custom filters and lenses for the cameras of the future to shape how artificial intelligence sees our world. Traditionally, the best cameras were those that could capture a scene exactly as our human eyes could see it. But for a camera that's taking in visual information to be used by a computer program, why wouldn't we want to customize the camera with the application in mind? Better yet, we might as well make this camera a part of the algorithm. The fundamental question then is this. What kind of filters do robots, self-driving cars, and drones want? Or to translate for the non-millennial audience out there, how do we design the visual system of a robot? The research that I've been working on at the Computational Imaging Lab at Stanford seeks to answer this question. We've been working on unifying the camera and the computer, or in other words, the optics and the electronics, bringing them together into this hybrid optical electronic neural network. To start, we picked a simple classification problem and a simple neural network, half of which would be optical and the other half electronic. We designed this system to categorize images of common objects such as cars, trucks, cats, dogs, and so on. Normally, you, take, you use your camera to take a full resolution image of such an object, and then you pass all the pixels to the computer for digital processing. What we've built to replace this is this hardware component that is a cross between a camera lens and a computer chip. It's this piece of glass that is shaped in a way such that it stores a layer of neural network filters in its design. We use that same kind of learning process as I described earlier, except now the network also has to figure out the best physical camera filters to help correctly identify the object. We place this optical element in the aperture of an imaging system, which if you've ever used one of those big DSLR cameras before, is that part of the camera where you can adjust the shutter size. As an image passes through this lens system, the neural network filters stored in that optical chip are automatically applied as a result of the interference between light waves. Whereas a standard grayscale camera would see a single two-dimensional copy of the world, this optical device splits the light into multiple copies, each with a different filter applied. By the time the image reaches the camera sensor, that first layer of the neural network is already computed, and we didn't have to supply any input electricity. We pass this version of the image to the GPU for processing, which only has to perform less than half of the work that it did before. So this is just a simple model, and we'll need to continue on building it to make it ready for practical use, but it gives us a taste of the types of benefits this system has to offer in terms of speed and power. And consider this analogy. If you give me some large multiplication problem to solve in my head, it's gonna take me a minute. There are some people out there, though, maybe even in this room, that could give you the answer in the snap of a finger. My brain and this other person's brain, they're both brains, but somehow information is coming out faster in one case than the other. That's the type of speed up that we're looking for in our optical neural network, as light travels through the optical portion at the speed of light, which is the fastest that our information can travel. Maybe it's just a half second speed up, but if your car autopilot is driving you at 60 miles per hour when suddenly a deer appears in its distance, that's 40 feet earlier your car can start to apply its brakes and avoid a collision. In addition to that, suppose I need a cup of coffee to power me every time I get another multiplication problem to solve, whereas this other person is good to go bright and early right out of bed. I mean, who would you want on your mental math team? That coffee, that's the energy that a light-based neural network may be able to save. Even if it's just a fraction of the total energy needed to power your self-driving car, it could amount to that extra trip home you're able to squeeze in even after the fuel tank light comes on. We've all been there before you have to recharge the car. So if we can build a full-scale optical neural network that can deliver on both speed and power while maintaining the performance results of a fully electronic state-of-the-art neural network, 
we could transform the way computer vision systems are designed. We're not quite there yet, but we and many other scientists and engineers are working on it. So the main point of this talk was to share with you all this idea of designing specialized cameras for AI. But while we do this in the lab, it's also worthwhile to reflect upon how much the things we do on a daily basis are influenced by how we see. Not just the reds, blues, and greens, or even those perfectly polished Instagram photos, but the way we interpret life through our own individual filters that we've developed through our personal experience on this earth. There's so much diversity in this room in terms of background, heritage, and skill sets that the same situation may be interpreted totally differently through your neighbor's eyes than yours. So that's all to say, we'll keep thinking about designing filters for robots, but at the same time, let's not forget that we all have different filters we could apply in front of our own eyes to help us see the world in a different, more compassionate light. Thank you.